Somebody asked at a meeting, how should evolution be understood? The evolution of man, G replied, can be taken as the development in him of those powers and possibilities which never develop by themselves, that is, mechanically. Only this kind of development, only this kind of growth, marks the real evolution of man. There is, and there can be, no other kind of evolution, whatever. We have before us man at the present moment of his development. Nature has made him such as he is, and in large masses. So far as we can see, such he will remain. Changes likely to violate the general requirements of nature can only take place in separate units. In order to understand the law of man's evolution, it is necessary to grasp that, beyond a certain point, this evolution is not at all necessary. That is to say, it is not necessary for nature at a given moment in its own development to speak more precisely. The evolution of mankind corresponds to the evolution of the planets. But the evolution of the planets proceeds for us in infinitely prolonged cycles of time. Throughout the stretch of time that human thought can embrace, no essential changes can take place in the life of the planets and consequently, no essential changes can take place in the life of mankind. Humanity neither progresses nor evolves. What seems to us to be progress or evolution is a partial modification which can be immediately counterbalanced by a corresponding modification in an opposite direction. Humanity, like the rest of organic life, exists on earth for the needs and purposes of the earth, and it is exactly as it should be for the earth's requirements at the present time. Only thought as theoretical and as far removed from fact as modern European thought could have conceived the evolution of man to be possible apart from surrounding nature or have regarded the evolution of man as a gradual conquest of nature. This is quite impossible. In living, in dying, in evolving, in degenerating, man equally serves the purposes of nature, or rather, nature makes equal use, though perhaps for different purposes, of the products of both evolution and degeneration. And at the same time, humanity as a whole can never escape from nature. For even in struggling against nature, man acts in conformity with her purposes. The evolution of large masses of humanity is opposed to nature's purposes. The evolution of a certain small percentage may be in accord with nature's purposes. Man contains within him the possibility of evolution. But the evolution of humanity as a whole, that is, the development of these possibilities in all men, or in most of them, or even in a large number of them, is not necessary for the purposes of the earth or of the planetary world in general, and it might in fact be injurious or fatal. There exist therefore special forces of a planetary character, which oppose the evolution of large masses of humanity and keep it at the level it ought to be. For instance, the evolution of humanity beyond a certain point, or, to speak more correctly, above a certain percentage, would be fatal for the moon. The moon at present feeds on organic life, on humanity. Humanity is a part of organic life, this means that humanity is food for the moon. If all men were to become too intelligent, they would not want to be eaten by the moon. But at the same time, possibilities of evolution exist, and they may be developed in separate individuals with the help of appropriate knowledge and methods. Such development can take place only in the interests of the man himself, against, so to speak, the interest and forces of the planetary world. The man must understand this. His evolution is necessary only to himself.
No one else is interested in it, and no one is obliged or intends to help him. On the contrary, the forces which oppose the evolution of large masses of humanity also oppose the evolution of individual men. A man must outwit them, and one man can outwit them. Humanity cannot. You will understand later on all these obstacles are very useful to a man. If they did not exist, they would have to be created intentionally because it is by overcoming obstacles that man develops those qualities he needs. This is the basis of the correct view of human evolution. There is no compulsory mechanical evolution. Evolution is the result of conscious struggle. Nature does not need this evolution. It does not want it and struggles against it. Evolution can be necessary only to man himself when he realizes his position, realizes the possibility of changing this position, realizes that he has powers that he does not use, riches that he does not see. And in the sense of gaining possession of these powers and riches, evolution is possible. But if all men or most of them realized this and desired to obtain what belongs to them by a right of birth, evolution would again become impossible. What is possible for individual man is impossible for the masses.